All right, welcome to another Saturday edition of In Class with Dr. Gray Carr. Um, this is somber. I didn't sleep well last night, Dr. Carr. Um, my soul is not at ease. My spirit is not right. And it's like uh, the thing that I predicted in 2016 has now come to fruition. Uh, during the 2016 yes. election, I was every day on the airwaves saying, I don't care about Hillary Clinton. This is all about the Supreme Court. It's all about the courts. This is, the, the presidency is temporary. The courts, that's a job for life. If you don't like Hillary, make sure you cast a vote for her because we need the Supreme Court to be a certain way. And if Trump right. is elected, he's gonna put wilding out folk on the Supreme Court that will infringe upon your rights. We're not just talking about voting rights, we're talking about your very right as a human being. I said this, I said it every day, ad nauseum, people didn't listen. And now here we are with the reality and you're gonna tell us maybe it's not that bad, but I think it's worse than what we think. Thank you, Dr. Carr, for being here today. I don't really see a way out of this. Uh, tell us, tell us uh, why the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and that seat. And, he, and I just want to say this uh, also. Trump knew that she was very sick because this week there was a story that he put 12, 20 extra names. It was random. We're in the midst of a pandemic, an election. Random. He put out a new list of potential Supreme Court justices that included Tom Cotton, your favorite uh, senator, and Ted Cruz. <laughs> And I'm like, why is he doing this? And then when he was asked yesterday, oh, I didn't know. He's a liar. He knew she was sick and he knew she was dying and he knew that he would have another pick on the Supreme Court and he's got Mitch McConnell in his pocket. All right, I'm, I'm done. I, I don't know what to make of this. Please, please help don't, me. please don't be done. Please, please. We need, if, 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 if someone who had the ability, who was the president when you said that in 2016? Oh, Barack Obama? had listened to you, we wouldn't be in this mess. In fact, when he nominated uh, Merrick Garland, if he had nominated a black woman, I suspect Hillary Clinton would be making this pick right now. I'm not putting this on the 44th president of the United States, but I am saying that the former junior senator from Illinois who became president, like a great number of our people in this country, have a fundamental misunderstanding of where we live. I understand why they have a fundamental misunderstanding because they want to live in a place that's not real. They, are spot, they want America to be something other than it is. But when they stole the election, the White Nationalist Party stole the election of 2004, Everybody knows they stole the election of 2000. In fact, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was the, one of the dissenters in Bush v. Gore, uh, the Supreme Court case where the Supreme Court of the United States of America stopped votes from continuing to be counted in one of the 50 states, intervene in what is, by federal uh, standards, a state concern election to stop the counting. In a, in, a, in a decision that was so absurd that when you read Bush versus Gore, one of the things they say in the majority opinion is that this case really can't be used for precedent, which is unheard of in the law. Don't cite this case for nothing else because we know that this logic is so convoluted from the standing issue. Well, how, how, did, how did George Bush have standing to intervene when he voted in Texas? But it, that's neither, you know, that Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the dissent Joining the dissent in Bush v. Gore says, you know, today, what you all have done, it's right here, it's gonna echo down through the ages. So I'm not talking about the, the election they stole in 2000. I'm talking about the one they stole in 2004 with John Kerry. I mean, you, had, yeah, you know, you had to get your friend Greg Palast and them back on and talk about how they stole that election. Cause that's, they, they perfect, they've perfected their technique for stealing elections now. It involves uh, disqualifying cast votes. And that's why I'm gonna be voting in person, early voting. Because if you mail it in, they're just going to say your signature doesn't match it. You didn't cross the T on the stem of your letter and throw it out. Uh, they throw the voter per voter rolls purging, this kind of thing. So when they stole election 2004, I never forget John Kerry, you remember, was running for president. And one of the slogans that he adopted uh, from in his campaign was from a Langston Hughes poem, Let America Be America Again. This poem was taken out of many anthologies during the so-called Red Scare, 
McCarthy, uh, the grand, great grandfather of uh, real clowns like Tom Cotton and his little junior's devil's apprentice, this little snot-nosed former Missouri Attorney General who's now in the United States Senate, Josh Harley, whose name is also on that list that Trump, knowing well that Ruth Gader Ginsburg was breathing her last breath, uh, tried it out, along with that little black kid from uh, uh, Kentucky who used to be a general counsel for Mitch McConnell, uh, married to the white woman who's, uh, who will not uh, pursue Breonna Taylor's killers, Daniel Cameron down there in Kentucky, whose name was on the list. I suspect they have uh, Clarence Thomas's um, uh, seat in, in, in lined up for him, I would suspect, uh, because unlike the 44th president, the 45th president has no problem interfering in anything. And so whereas I'm sure Barack Obama, out of respect for uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, would not call her and say, sis, you know, you've been on a good strong 20 years. Because if you go back 20, to 2013, you know, she was appointed in 2003 with Clinton. On the 20th anniversary, people were saying, well, you know, sis, maybe it's time because we want a Democratic president. And she said at that time, oh, no, I'm sure there'll be a fine president after this one. No, Ruth, I mean, I ain't mad. She's a notorious RBG. But at the same time, people could see, you know, what was coming. And, and Obama would have had that pick. But I'm sure he didn't call her and say that. Now, I'm sure Trump, if he steals, when, if and when he steals this election, will have no problem calling Clarence and say, Clarence, we got a young Clarence out there in Kentucky we want to put on. It's time for you to go. But John Kerry, in his 2004 campaign, adopted a phrase from a Langston Hughes poem that was... Uh, taken out of many anthologies when they were leaning on Langston Hughes back in the 50s to denounce Paul Robeson and uh, McCarthy, as I said, that great grandfather of people like Cotton and Cruz and Harley and them were leaning on people, right? And they took that poem out of many anthologies. So when he, when he was going around the country saying, let America be America again, I, I said, wait a minute, he's pulling up that Langston Hughes poem? So I told my students, I said, let's pull it up. That's the poem where Langston Hughes said, America never was America to me. But this I vow, America will be. And that's the fundamental mistake that Barack Obama and many other Black people, including many today who are worried about this thing, make about this country. They want to think about this country as they want it to be, not as it is. Not as it has always been. This is a white nationalist settler colony project. And there are many, millions of white people, people who watch you, Karen, people who listen to you, people who, who want this country to be a different country as well. And there are millions of others who will hold on to white nationalist terrorism until their fingernails crumble. One of them is in the White House. Another is the leader of the United States Senate. And what they are prepared to do, what they are gearing up to do, this feckless ghoul from Kentucky who uh, only uses words when it's advantageous to him, who has said, oh, yeah, well, we're going to have a, a quick confirmation. Of course you are, Klansman. This is your natural job to put somebody else on this. Man. They're going to ram through a nominee. So for those of our friends who are, Black nationalists, Pan-Africanists, who say it doesn't matter. For those of our friends who would say they've given a deep analysis of this and they understand the nature of racial capitalism and critical race, and they, and they say, no, the Democrats and Republicans are both just wings of the corporate party. For all of them, perhaps we should take 15, 20 minutes and maybe walk through some things that they may find difficult to answer at this moment. Because one person should never have that much power, Karen. But no, when I, when I, so I guess, as we get ready to talk a little bit about why, what Ruth Gate Bader Ginsburg means, meaning what the courts mean, uh, what this battle is going to, it's, well, I don't know if it's even going to be a battle. Um, I share. It could be. It, it could be. I'm, no, but talk, talk, talk to me. Talk to us. What are you, what are you thinking? I'm, I'm always optimistic, but I'm less optimistic than I've ever been in my entire life about this nation, about people, about humanity. Right. I, I'm every day I'm disappointed and my soul hurts. It really does mm. that we are so ignorant that we don't that we lack civic knowledge, that we understand uh, community, all of the things that were that are required of us to be successful as human beings and as a people we lack. And every day I'm confronted with this lack. And I don't know what to do about it. We do these classes on Saturday and for three hours a day, Monday through Friday, I fight the good fight. But Dr. Yes, you Carr, do. Dr. Gray Carr, <laughs> I, I never thought I would be saying this, 
But last night I was online and I filled out a visa for another country. I filled out a visa to leave this country and I've never done that, never thought about doing it. I was the person that I'm gonna stay here and fight to the last, no. I, I'm not fighting for people who sit at home, who are following behind nonsense, who don't have enough wherewithal to even know that there are 50 senators, excuse me, that there are 100 senators, two from each state, that you don't even know what the process is, that you don't even know why Mitch McConnell can do what he's about to do. Come on. And he can't do it. Yes, he absolutely, why you don't understand why this president with the executive order pen can do just about any damn thing he wants to. That you understand that elections have consequences. I, I don't know what to do with this. And I'm not going to sit here and watch Rome burn. I have, <laughs> I have a visa, excuse me, a passport and some cash. And I don't have to live high on the hog. I'm going to find where Asada Shakur is. But maybe we can hang out for a bit in her latter days on this earth. And maybe I can learn <laughs> well, some things. I don't know. but I, I, I'm, I'm going to just... <laughs> tell you right now on good authority. You ain't gonna find a side of Cubans have been very clear about that. Now, even wow. even though she might want to find you, I'm just saying if she, wow. she wanna find but 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 I hear what you're saying and I agree. I, I don't I mean that's one reason why this morning, I mean we had y'all watching this, y'all yeah, we had a whole nother thing playing. Yes, we did. We were talking to man, and then this thing went down late last night. You say, okay, you know we got yeah, okay, we gotta talk about this. And so, you know, you you, this is what you do, educate folk. And so it's important for us to pause this morning and think about that. And when you say that you, you know, went online and got a visa, you know, I, this morning I got up and I said, boy, and it's kind of cool, it's getting cool outside, so I put on my hoodie. And I looked over and I saw my Marcus Garvey hoodie. This is the Black Star, this is a stock certificate in the Black Star line. All my Garvey, I I got a few Garveyite friends who are like, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to vote. I said, do you understand 1925 that that was a federal case before a federal judge that Marcus Garvey, they put him up on trumped up charge of mail fraud and Garvey didn't say it didn't matter who the judge was. Garvey was in court. Then they appealed and the court of appeals said, no, nah, the district court was right because the only thing they convicted him on was an empty envelope that the guy that they forced to testify, the black dude said, it was a stock certificate in this, it was an advertisement in this envelope trying to get money from me. And so that's what they used to convict him of using the mails to defraud. And the court said, you don't have to have the actual certificate as long as the envelope came from them and has the address this mail to. A judge made that determination and could have determined it the other way. And I'm sure the response will be, well, that just shows you that the, the courts are dirty. Okay. Okay, Marcus Garvey from Jamaica, Marcus Garvey who was then put in the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary for two years and then deported from the United States of America. These are all federal agencies. All my friends who say that everything is the same and it don't matter. Uh, Marcus Garvey, who never again set foot in, in the United States of America, got as close to Canada to give talks, ended up passing away in England, 1940. Marcus Garvey, who never set foot on the continent of Africa, Meaning we don't we don't have to when people say, oh, Garvey wanted to go back to Africa. No, what Garvey wanted was for black people, wherever we are, to understand that we are connected. We are connected by culture, we are connected by blood, we are connected by historical experiences, and we are not the same, but we are connected. So the whole idea is that because we are connected, we should make some political moves with that in mind. Now, why is that important and why is that what's that got to do with Ruth Bader Ginsburg? What does it have to do with the thing that we were going to talk about, which I guess we'll mention in, 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 over the course of the next few minutes, which is this, you know, response to this 1619 project, this 1776 project. You know, in my mind, those dates are the same because they both speak to an attempt to have our people, Black people, turn inward. And in the line from Langston Hughes, who through pressure, kind of backed up from defending his friends, Paul Robeson and them. And then later in life said, you know, before he passed in 1967, I kind of regret that. Jack Robinson, who they leaned on to testify at the Senate, and he said, you know, I don't know why Paul Robeson is talking like that. I mean, this country has allowed him to make, I know this country isn't perfect and we got a lot of work to do, but I don't think Paul Robeson should be criticizing the United States of America because Russia and them will jump in. I mean, what, 
what what 1619, what 1776, what 1787, when the Constitution was ratified, what 1865, the end of the Civil War, and then the passage of the 13th Amendment, what 1965, the Voting Rights Act, all those numbers are, 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 are part of a narrative that want us to look inward at the United States, and no matter what it does, for us never to look around the world while we are in the United States. It doesn't mean you gotta pick either or, but it means you are connected. We are part of a chain. We are connected. And every time a person of African descent in one of two categories, either someone who begins to get the imagination of a handful of black folk, then a handful more, then a, then a little bit more than the people who are open enemies want them to have, like a Marcus Garvey, talking to these poor black people in the South, the largest number of chapters of the Universal Negro Improvement Association in the United States were in the South. Most of those chapters were in the South. You got black folks who are facing Jim Crow. Garvey comes along and says, you know, we Africa, Africa with the Africans. They say, you know what? Shit, I'll go to Africa. <laughs> like, you know what? I ain't got to go to Africa, but I'm going to buy this land. Garvey said, yeah, buy your land. Let's connect. And then I'm going to get some ships. And whatever you grow here, we're just going to ship it back and forth since they want us to be in business. When you get a little bit big like that, then they come at you and they start attacking you. And then they go find other Negroes who they want to look inward and say, you should be against him. I think he's being a tool. He's a tool of foreign influence. And so you see, and sadly, people like W.E.B. Du Bois, people like uh, A. Philip Randolph, who was an open socialist, part of this Garvey must go campaign. Well, what are you doing? Don't, don't look, you might not like everything he says, you might not like the fact he's from Jamaica. You might not like the fact that he be parading through Harlem with them hats with feathers on them and a bunch of people dressed up in, in nurse uniforms, the Black Cross nurses and all these brothers who are Pullman forwarders on the weekend, they got their sword in the Black Legion. You might not like none of that, but why must you side with your open enemy, J. J. Edgar Hoover and them, against this guy? Because you know what's gonna happen. Once they get him, they come in for you. And that's exactly what they did. Jagger Hoover called A. Philip Randolph the most dangerous Negro in America because he was an open socialist. And he tried to say, oh, you get the Russians. So when Trump has started talking about sedition and all that, hell, John Adams was talking about that with the Alien Sedition Act. Then you come forward to the Palmer Raids in the first quarter of the 20th century. They're going to get you too because the central thread that binds a Garvey to a Du Bois, binds a Garvey and a Du Bois to A. Philip Randolph is that you ain't going to die on the hill called America. Because you understand that this country that you live in is one country in the world, and you're a citizen of the world. And so that first category is those people nobody really knew about who began to get a little bit of the Black imagination to say, I may not ever leave Louisiana, Queen Mother Audley Moore. These people now writing about reparations. Y'all know about Queen Audley Moore. They're making money now writing books on these these uh these black revolutionaries but none of these negroes writing books will bust a grape and a fruit salad but they want to write about it so they can talk about revolution instead of being revolution queen mother moore from new iberia louisiana who fought for reparations her whole life who was engaged with the communist party in the 1930s and 40s at the same time rosa parks and them rosa and raymond parks in alabama engaged with the scottsboro defense trial because there's an alabama communist party that's black my buddy robin kelly writes about that in his first book it was a dissertation hammer and hoe as they're doing that they never go to africa but they understand they're connected to a world movement and that first category is what the government turns around and says y'all leave them alone now we're going to tie this through Betty ginsburg in a minute what's going on the second category of people that the government turns on for doing the same thing is black people who have some prominence and some some notoriety Paul Robeson's cool as long as he's playing football for Rutgers. Paul Robeson's cool as long as he's an actor and a singer. He and his wife, as Londa, going around doing. Paul Robeson gets in trouble when he says, I am a citizen of the world. S.E. Robeson gets in trouble when she says, I'm a citizen of the world. And they start traveling around and they say, civil rights in America is very important, but civil rights, we should really be calling them human rights. Every human being has a right to not have to go to a dangerous workplace. So when the ropes and show up in England and the Welsh miners embrace them and he comes out and he goes into films and he's making these films set in Great Britain uh, where he comes out and he's, he's working in the mines and he starts singing, Lord God of Abraham. And all these white Welsh miners like, who is that singing? That's Paul Robeson. He's with us, he's a miner. And that the United States government is like, hold on man, hold up. You're an American. 
Parks and say, don't you know I'm an, yeah, I am an American. And they call him before that same House Un-American Activity Committee. And then when they ask him, oh, are, are you a member of the Communist Party? He said, do you want to also see how I vote? You want to come in the ballot box? There's the First Amendment. I don't have to tell you shit. In fact, my grandfather built was a slave. My people built this country. And no fascist-minded people like you going to run me away from it. Now, they'll quote that in the history books. But what they have a difficult time quoting is the fact that he would say that at the same time that he said, I am an African. I want to be African. Sterling Stuckey writes about this. Paul Robeson's traveling the world. Every country you go to, he sings songs in the languages of the people. The United States government is like, what the hell's going on? Now I'm coming forward to this Ruth Bader Ginsburg piece. Why? Because this is the 1940s and 50s. So what, what did the federal government do? They start leaning on American Negroes like Roy Wilkins, NAACP uh, guy. They start leaning on other blacks and they say to them, look, your best chance is in America. So y'all stop, y'all watch out for Paul Robeson and S.E. Robeson. You watch out for William Patterson and his wife, Louise Thompson Patterson, who, who William Patterson, one of those black lawyers to help with the Scottsboro boys, a communist. No, these communists, see, you got to watch them. Y'all watch out for uh, Shirley Graham Du Bois and her husband, W.E.B. Du Bois, that old man crazy anyway. And they back up away from, in fact, um, Oh my goodness. You know, you, 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 when we flipped it, I started looking for other stuff too. Oh yeah, here we go. Very good book by, let me see. I know I got one over here. Yeah, Carol Anderson. Carol Anderson wrote a book called Eyes Off the Prize. The United Nations and the African-American Struggle for Human Rights, 1944 to 1965. You see who's on the cover there, Roy Wilkins. It, oh, Roy Wilkins over here. Here's Walter White, who Du Bois used to call White Walter, but that's a story for another day. But who is this? Thurgood Marshall. Why? Because, because Marshall gets caught up in the anti-communist stuff too. And he's like, y'all need to be, this is domestic. Our fight is domestic. Even though his Jegna, even though his mentor, Charles Hamilton Houston, as far as I'm concerned, the greatest legal mind America has produced, period. Charles Hamilton Houston was friends with William uh, pa uh, William Patterson, the lawyer, Charles Hamilton Houston understands it's a global thing. His protege, his student, Thurgood Marshall, gets shook by these American nationalists, and he said, "I'm fighting for black rights, and I'm fight, but I'm fighting here." Even though Thurgood Marshall helps during the period of decolonization, uh, Kenya and other places write their constitutions, so he's he's helping Africa. But he said, "I'm an American. I'm an American Negro." That's one of the reasons. Uh, even. Um, Later on, when, remember when Muhammad Ali's case came before the Supreme Court, Marshall recuses himself. He's talking all kinds of shit against uh, uh, Elijah Muhammad and all of them. So yeah, these Muslims. So anyway, in the 50s, this, this government makes a deal. You black leaders, that second category, not Marcus Garvey and them people you didn't know until they started getting popular support, but you black leaders with some prominence, when one of y'all stand up and start talking crazy like y'all citizens of the world, we're going to punish you. So they took the Robeson's passports, took Du Bois and them passports, took the Patterson's passports. And then these NAACP Negroes said, well, see, that's what y'all do, because y'all part of them communists. You know, we don't like them squashing rights. But at the same time, you need to understand our fight is in America. And that sets the framework and the flavor for what ends up being the biggest case that Thurgood Marshall won in his career, which is Brown versus Board of Education. A lot of scholars, Carol Anderson being one, uh, many others, Gerald Horn being another, say, you know, one of the reasons that we made progress in terms of the courts in the 1950s and 60s and legislation and legislation of the 60s is because this government, particularly the federal government, understood that if you didn't ease up on black people in this country, we're going to start looking other places and making common calls. And you have a problem because there's the United Nations now. And all these new African nations you want to steal from anew, all their resources and stuff, they're going to start talking to the Russians and the Chinese who are telling them in a propaganda war, you don't need to mess with the United States. Look how they're doing them black people over there. And some of them black people is looking at you like, yeah, we family. Martin Luther King, Chris King in 1957, the same year they passed the Civil Rights Act of 1957 under Truman, the first piece of federal civil rights legislation since Reconstruction, that same year, Kwame Nkrumah invites the kings to come to Ghana for the, his inauguration, and they go. Richard Nixon goes for the uh, United States government, gets over there, and it's like, what the hell are y'all doing here? Richard uh, King and him is like, yeah, our brother invited us. 
Nixon gets back to the United States, hey man, they talking to the Africans. Do you understand? I mean, King, oh, shortly they are, oh, King's communist. I mean, the, this whole project of America, I don't care if it's a 1619 project, 1776 project, relies on us cutting ourselves off from other people, other places, regardless of race, but especially black people, and focusing exclusively, putting all our eggs in the American basket. Now, what does that have to do with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, whose family came here from Russia? Soviet Jews, Russian Jews. Her daddy came here, he was 13 years old in New York. Ain't nobody questioning whether the notorious RBG was an American. Why? Because in America, America means white. You can't never be no American, Karen, neither can I, to the demographics change and what Mitch McConnell is doing, who, who got another eight judges through last week instead of passing the CARES Act, $3 billion, hold, holding up that $25 billion for the post office, got eight more judges through. They had about two, a little over 260 now. They, Lindsey Graham said they got another 30 teed up before the end of this month. These devils are saying, I don't care how many babies y'all have. We're going to put a bunch of 40-year-old Klansmen on, and I think it's only one woman been nominated to, to be appointed. We're going to put all these white men on this thing in, like, in their 40s, and we're going to run this for another two generations because you don't understand that we don't need the numbers as long as we've got the law and the guns. And so what we have to do now is re- uh, reimagine this settler project we want to hold on to as one that we're going to hold on to by force. That's the role that the courts will play. So what I'm saying is that while McConnell's been doing that, dealing with judges, what we have to understand is that Ruth Bader Ginsburg, whose parents come here from Russia, who was raised in Brooklyn, who is one of, what is it, eight or nine women in her Harvard Law class, who then transfers to Columbia, her husband, uh, Marty was a tax lawyer. You know, she, she, I mean, I'm gonna tell you, man, black, I mean, women, period. But of course, black women are the mothers of every human being that will ever walk on the earth. You know, I was laughing because, you know, we were, we were watching uh, Patty versus uh, Gladys last week. And uh, and then Dion Ward w w walked out. So I just tweeted, you was tweeting out, I was tweeting, you know, the black woman is God. I mean, that's just, anybody want to at, at us all on that. But I'm saying, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, this woman has a family. She graduated in the top of her class. She goes from Harvard to Columbia because it's going to be better for the marriage. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Never slows down. Relentless. This woman barely, barely five foot tall when she made transition. I eat 100 pounds. I'm saying with this black dude who's her trainer who wrote a whole book about her regimen. She out here like Jim Brown some or Serena Williams with this, with this training regimen. I don't know if you saw that 2018 documentary that opens with her in the gym. I'm, I'm ashamed. I'm sitting in the theater like, Damn, <laughs> what the hell? But this woman who, who bulls her way through the legal profession, she was at the top of her class. Felix Frankfurter, who was on the Supreme Court, was offered Ruth Bader Ginsburg as a clerk. And of course, that's the fast track. He said, now nah, I ain't ready for a woman. Wait, what? Yeah, discrimination. So what does she do? She goes on and goes into practice. She don't let it stop her. Now imagine that. I mean, just to make you know, so, 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 so the point I'm trying to make is as she's working her way through in the 1960s and 70s, she ends up at the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, she's part of the project to fight for women's rights. And so you see her arguing those cases. I mean, what they made of, what was that movie they made a couple of years ago, Karen? It was a fictional, it's like a, a um, I forget the woman who played her, but she made, they made a movie about her, her legal battles. She won a battle in 1971, uh, Reed versus Reed, because they were saying that, you know, who gets to administer the, uh, uh, the uh, who should be the executor of um, an estate? Women perhaps don't have the capacity. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, what the hell are you talking about? She wins that case. A couple of years later, Frontiero case. The Frontiero case, uh, you know, argues that military benefits, uh, widow benefits, you know, perhaps if a woman passes is in the military, perhaps it, you know, it isn't, it, you know, they aren't in the same position as men in a relationship. So, you know, maybe they, they don't need to have all the benefits accrued the same way. She goes and argues that case, wins that case. And so she begins, she has made a name for herself as a, um, as a legend, really, before she ever becomes a judge. The movie is on the basis of sex. There it is, on the basis, there, thank you. And Actually, Felicity, that's perfect. Felicity wait, 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 uh, Jones played her. Yes. 
and, and that that's actually very important. Thank you, Karen, because that phrase on the basis of sex, since then in the American Constitution, race, sex are not engendered in the cold four corners of the document statute. That's judge-made law to interpret what these laws mean. That's why I've always, you know, my law students, I always ask them, you know, why do you need a 14th Amendment when you have a Fifth Amendment? I mean, that's the government, that's the state trying to correct the flaws in the document. But I'm thinking theoretically, that's on, you know, Roger Taney and Dred Scott creates this notion of state citizenship and federal citizenship in a way trying to maintain slavery in, in my mind. But I'm saying all that, I won't get too deep in the weeds on the legal piece of it, but a lot of what we take as the law is judge-made law. So when, 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 um, when Ginsburg, the, the phrase from that movie on the basis of sex is an argument that finds its way into statutes that say you can't discriminate on the basis of sex. But then the question becomes, what does sex mean? That's why these cases most recently about gender, you know, are important. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I'm trans or I'm queer. I say, well, that should cover me. I mean, sex, no, no. Sex means biological. I mean, a man with a penis and a woman with a vagina. They don't know. The judge going to tell you what sex means. So what Ginsburg is doing in the 60s and 70s is expanding the legal universe to make sure that women cannot be discriminated against on these things that judges will have to decide because it is not clear in the four corners of the plain document how to interpret this. So should women be discriminated against, for example? Well, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, let better know. So what happens? She's attracted a lot of attention. William Jefferson Clinton gets, on the, uh, gets elected president. He gets to pick a Supreme Court justice. So what does he do? 2000. And I guess, no, 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 93, 1993, he picks Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is the first Supreme Court justice selected by Democrat, by a Democratic president in 26 years. You know, the last Democratic president, uh, the last Democratic president that got to pick a Supreme Court justice was Lyndon Baines Johnson. It was Thurgood Marshall. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, 26 years later, is the next. Because what have these Republicans done? See, they're leaning on this damn uh, uh, electoral college. In fact, let me pause here and say that a majority of the Supreme Court justices right now have been appointed by presidents that lost the popular vote. Well, Sam fight. Alito, that fascist mm -hmm. out, of, out of Pennsylvania. Clarence Thomas. No. No, can you count Clarence? Oh, no, yeah, yeah. Can you George count George W. Bush. All Republicans. But let, let's see. You got no. Kavanaugh and Gorsuch. That's Trump. He lost the popular vote. Alito. Alito. And that's Roberts. Bush. And Roberts. He lost the popular vote. That's right. Gore. Right. Right. His Gore. daddy appointed Clarence Thomas. I remember that case. That's right. George W. That's right. His daddy appointed. Uh, and I'm trying to remember if he won the popular vote. But at either rate. He won the popular vote. It was, it was George, he won the popular vote. Okay. George W. Bush so, so, and Trump, two people that did not win the popular vote, appointed four of the five uh, Republican appointees. That's right. And if Amy, and people are saying maybe Amy Barrett, uh, who is a, a right winger, who they're saying that might be the woman they want to put on. But see, these are white men. So I know these white women think that they play. No, these are white men. Meaning what? They don't give a damn about you either. They're going to put some more white men on the court. So don't think you're going to. I, I think they might do that because 53% of white women, as a matter of fact, I think white women sometimes are more horrific than, than white men. Oh, uh, no question. Uh, I, I just think, you know, uh, they're protecting their, their legacy as well and their son That's right. and, their, and their future. And they're invested in a way uh, that I, I have seen, particularly in corporate America, some of the most treacherous people, uh, some of the most horrific people in terms of race relations have been white women in terms of blockage. So I, I think they might do that to throw a bone to the 53% in the suburban white women that Trump has been trying to appeal Ooh, to. That's you a know, very strategy. That's a compelling argument. I, that's a compelling argument. And I agree with you 100%. That makes a lot of sense, Karen. That's right. As, as Tammy Wynette used to say down my way when she, she and her and George Jones was throwing bottles at each other, stand by your man. Tell the world you love him. Give him two arms to cling to when nights are cold and lonely. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. You, you're right. That makes a lot of strategic sense. Because, of course, Trump is trying to get this election close enough to steal. 
That would make perfect sense. And then, of course, at that point, a majority of justices on the court have been picked by people who lost the popular vote. Because again, this fascism depends in many ways on the Electoral College. So when Clinton po appoints her to the Supreme Court, you know, the interesting thing about it is she had been on the D.C. Court of Appeals for about 12, 13 years. I think Carter for, uh, appointed her in 1980, which is interesting because she was on the D.C. Appeals Court. This is a great book. Because again, we ain't talked about no black justices except uh, Thurgood Marshall, because he was the only one. Then Clarence Thomas, as you say. But there were a lot that could have been. Pauli Murray should have been on the Supreme Court. She should have been the first. I mean, Pauli Murray wrote the first book on the civil rights laws of the United States. And she also wrote a big book on the constitutions of Africa. This woman was brilliant. Then went back to school, got a PhD, and has been elevated in the Episcopal Church to a saint. She's Saint Pauli Murray in the Episcopal Church. You understand? Pauli Murray, should have, she, went to, she went to Howard Law School and she told her professor at the time, oh, this law is going to change. I bet you. And she bet her professor, Spotswood Robinson, who up until recently had the highest GPA in the history of Howard Law School, who was a professor at the time, he said, I bet you these laws going to change. And the laws did change. She said, no, they're going to change these laws. Because if you understand, Du Bois said that. Du Bois said they're going to change the laws because they want to keep us here in this thing. And they got to throw us a bone. But the us isn't the masses. This is what's going to come important in a minute about these judges. The, 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 it isn't us. It isn't Karen Hunter who can get a visa, who has a passport, who can take a couple of dollars that she squirreled away and get the hell out of here. It isn't Greg Carr who can do the same thing because we got friends other places. And I ain't got to live like no print. No, hell no, I'm going to Accra, or I'm going to Cairo, I'm going to Cape Town, somewhere. It's the people who can't do that, who are the vast majority. These are the cats going to get caught up in the BS bus for marijuana. These are the cats who are going to get locked up for some BS and then they appeal and then find out they done changed the whole federal bench and you getting from now on. These are the people, it don't matter whether we vote. No, I'm talking about you Negroes who have the option of sitting at your house. I'm talking about your, your, your cousin and them. They going to take the L. Stop lying to these people that it don't matter who it is. But we'll get to that. She arguing, it's Pauli Murray who should have been on the bench. She arguing with Spots with Robinson. When Ruth Bader Ginsburg gets put on the Supreme Court by Clinton, he elevates her from the D.C. Court of Appeals, which is often called the, the kind of triple uh, A farm team for the Supreme Court. So many people have come from that court here in D.C. going to the Supreme Court. Who was the chief judge at the time Ruth Bader Ginsburg was on the, on the D.C. Court, Court of Appeals. In other words, who was the boss judge of all those other judges? Spotswood Robinson, mm -hmm. former Howard University student, Howard faculty. That's him right there, Spotswood Robinson, with the man Oliver Hill. These, cat, these are cats who argue Brown versus Board of Education. These Charlie Houston's boys, too. I, I mean, I, I love and admire Thurgood Marshall, not his politics as much, but these dudes right here, and Paul D. Murray and them, Margaret Eds wrote this book, We Face the Dawn. There's a picture in here. I show my law students at Howard. This is the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit for the 1982-83 term. There's Spotswood Robinson sitting in the middle. Over here is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Next to her is Anthony Scalia. Yeah. Robert Bork is in this picture. The wow. man in charge of them, the chief judge. Spotswood Robinson should have been on the Supreme Court, but we live in a racist ass country. You know what I'm saying? This dude was brilliant. You understand? I mean, no disrespect to Thurgood Marshall, but let's be very clear. Spotswood Robinson, Pauli Murray, in my mind, the two great scholar, student, intellectuals coming out of Howard Law School. But anyway, that haven't been said. Was Thurgood more like a Jackie Robinson? Absolutely. Oh, you know what? You are, see, you already know. You already know. When they pull Robinson, playing second base from the Kansas City Monarchs, and you got Josh Gibson and Satchel Paige in the Negro Leagues, you don't want nobody in white major league baseball who's going to embarrass everybody. <laughs> so get the cat who is just about right. And Marshall was brilliant. Marshall was charismatic, all that. But you don't want nobody. You don't want Pauli Murray up there because she will embarrass all of y'all. She's going to be up there, and when, and, when, and when she gets on the bench, they're going to mention her name with uh, Cardozo. They're going to mention her name with Brandeis. They're going to mention her name with Oliver Wendell Holmes. And then when you put somebody like uh, uh, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg on there, the path has already been clear, but it was a black woman. So they couldn't do it. So they put her on the, on the bench. And what happens since then? And then we, I think we, we, gotta, we owe it to ourselves to get to the, to the meat of why this is important. 
Ruth Bader Ginsburg spends her time on the Supreme Court, often in dissent, often in dissent. In fact, prior to, you know, this recent spate of extremist judges, probably people know her for the VMI case. That was 1996, United States versus Virginia Military Institute. That's because it was an all male public institution in Virginia, the Virginia, Virginia Military Institute. And they didn't let women in. Ginsburg writes the opinion in US versus um, uh, Virginia that says you have to let women in. In other words, we're gonna create on the basis of sex has to be elevated to a protected class. Now, those folks who are lawyers or law students who study the law know that protected class means if this group is mentioned in the law or if, if the judge is determined that this group is being targeted by a law, even if it doesn't say it explicitly in the law, that means that the courts must now look at that law and what, using what they call a standard of strict scrutiny. We have to now look very closely at that law. And we are going to say this law is unconstitutional if if it's it if because we're looking at it strictly two things it has to two things two things have to occur number one we have to see if there is a compelling state interest so when you say segregation for example okay is there a compelling state interest for you to keep these races apart because race is a protected class uh well yeah we think that uh it's better for black people is that a compelling state interest? The judge is going to determine that. The second prong of the prong is, have you tailored, if we say that it's okay, have you tailored the law narrowly enough so that you can accomplish that? And that's the only way you can accomplish it, but no more. Let me give you a good example where you could use race for the law that would satisfy that test. Let's say, come in and say, uh, the state of Ohio uh, asks what race you are when they're collecting some medical information is that a compelling state interest well we know black people have higher tendency of blood high blood pressure and stress and there you know we have more kidney transplants whatever they say okay yeah that's a compelling state interest now let's look at the law is it narrowly are you asking about these things and only these things well not quite okay you need to go back and tailor that a little bit more narrowly you know what that's the, the the field probably where we're most familiar with that is is in admissions affirmative action that's where ginsburg and them been battling these last 10 years or so before scalia dropped dead and then you know so this whole idea that race can be used in admissions uh race protected class let's look at this real close strict scrutiny hmm uh what's the compelling state interest well, up until the Bakke case in 1976, the compelling state interest was to reverse previous discrimination or address previous discrimination. But in order for it to survive the judges, as the judges changed on the court, Lewis Powell, who uh, is followed by Sandra O'Connor, who's still alive, the first woman on the court, Lewis Powell says, well, I think the, the compelling state interest of affirmative action is, uh, is diversity. This ain't written in any law. The judges changed the rationale for affirmative action to from a weak reparations rationale, addressing past discrimination, to helping white people rationale, diversity. You want a few Negroes around so they can show you their funny dance moves and give you a little food you never had before. It's gonna help everything. So, I mean, that becomes, the rationale for admit using race and admissions all the way from Baki to Gruder to Gratz all the way to today. Meanwhile, I'm just saying in terms of this is how race is a protected class. Sex, not a protected class. This is going to blow some people's minds. There's a case on uh, a business case, Lochner era case, where it's called uh, Carol the Caroline Products case. This case is on something else. This case basically argues that if a state has an interest in advancing business or business relationships, it has wide latitude to uh, enact laws that will regulate that. And then there's a footnote, the fourth footnote in the opinion, Supreme Court opinion, what's this, 1932 or 33? I have to go back and check. Uh, Caroline Products, C-A-R-O-L-E-N-E, -E, Caroline Products case. There's a footnote in there, number four, 
Why do I know the number? Because every law student that's been in law school more than two months knows about famous footnote four. Because in that case, this is called, it's almost called dicta in the law, meaning this ain't even what the case is about, but in the footnote, I'm gonna mention something else. But once it's in there, it's part of the opinion. Famous footnote four says, now, there are certain categories that if they are mentioned, we think we need to look a little closer at the law. One of them is race. That's how race becomes a protected class, a footnote in a case on something else. <laughs> you understand? But what wasn't mentioned in that footnote? Gender or sex. Meaning what? Ruth Bader Ginsburg and them got a fight when she's a lawyer to get sex into the conversation because on the basis of sex ain't in famous footnote four. It's got to be interpreted, back mapped into the statutes, back mapped into the constitution. And so by the time she gets on the bench, her best known cases are usually around gender because now she's on the black robes side and she's gonna fight for women. Did y'all understand that? Because, and in fact, I, I won't even talk about, well, I'll I, I mention a couple of other cases that are very important because her dissents have been very important. She dissents in, and I'll mention a case that doesn't involve gender to come back to gender and then we can kind of wind to a close. Shelby County versus Alabama, um, versus Holder. Shelby County, Alabama versus Holder. That, of course, is the Voting Rights Act case, 2013, where uh, Uncle Clarence Thomas, his friend Johnny John Roberts and Alito and all of them decided to kick the teeth out of the Voting Rights Act, not by overturning the whole Voting Rights Act, because that would just be too gangster. By the way, they can do that now. They're going to get this seat. All uh, you Negroes saying it don't matter? Good, because you ain't going to be able to vote anyway. So the point is that, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Since it don't matter, you don't care. But the point is, because see, what they're going to say now is the states can manage elections any kind of way they want. Right now, with Ginsburg gone, with Ginsburg gone right now, they got a 5-3 majority. With Ginsburg's seat, they got a 6-3 majority. So what you're going to find is Sonia Sotomayor is going to be like Justice Harlan back in Plessy versus Ferguson. I'm writing the brilliant dissent so that your grandchildren can come up and make that the law if you're still alive. Because by then, after deregulating everything, global warming is going to blow your ass out the water anyway. See, people, oh, it don't matter. It don't matter. You're right. Don't breathe that smoke. Do you understand that they're getting ready to get, overturn every federal regulation ever been written and the court's going to let them do it? Anyway, the point is this. So when you look at what, um, what Ginsburg is doing, she's on that side interpreting the law. So when she, gets, when she dissents, like in uh, voting rights, Shelby County versus Holder, Roberts and them is like, we made a lot of progress in this country since the Voting Rights Act was passed. It looks pretty good. So uh, we don't really need the pre-clearance section, that's section four. People thought they were gonna go for section five. No, 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 no. In other words, states that are history of discriminating, uh, districts that have a, a history of discriminating had to send any changes they want to make in election law to the federal government to check to the attorney general. Now with Tody Barr, that wouldn't be an issue. They'd let it all go. But why even go through that step? We're going to make sure that we can attorney general proof this. We're going to Department of Justice Civil Rights Division proof this. We're going to attack this section of the Voting Rights Act. So Alabama comes up, usually with education, all the time is Texas or Louisiana. Alabama, we'll take the voting rights stuff. Because after all, John Lewis and all them crazy ass young black kids down here, we're going to get y'all in the court. We also don't like immigration. That's the Immigration and Nationalization Act of 1965. That's what Stephen Miller's worried about. It don't matter who the judge is. Okay, your cousins and them came here from somewhere else? Yeah, but they're citizens. They were born here. Birthright citizenship is something that the judges will decide. Okay, all right, since it don't matter, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, talking y'all talking about we Pan-Africans. You ain't no damn Pan-Africans. You didn't even stand for your cousin and them living in the Bronx, who now got to go before a federal judge. And they said, well, you know, we didn't undermine uh, birthright citizenship. I know you were technically born here, but you're only one generation here. So we're thinking you have a diminished set of rights in this country. I mean, let's be clear. So anyway, so in, in Shelby County, Alabama, they say, yeah, we discriminated in the past, but look at all these black people who are registered to vote now. And it's not the same as it used to be. So Roberts, in his infinite wisdom, who is an evil genius, John Roberts is brilliant. He's using the First Amendment freedom of association for a lot of this BS. It's gonna come, we'll come to the July, uh, what happened this past July with Ginsburg in a minute. Roberts on the bench like, well, they're not discriminating like they used to discriminate. You know what? Let's cobble together this majority, five, four, Shelby, versus, Shelby County versus Ho uh, Holder. We're gonna say you don't have to go through preclearance. Well, that caves the protection 
the Voting Rights Act is technically still there, but now if you get discriminated against, you got to sue after the election. And that's all they wanted. We just got to be able to get it to the end. Now, we, have, we don't care if we lose, although with all these judges, they ain't going to lose another case for another 40 years. But, you know, just in case, you know, you, we don't care if you sue us after the election, as long as we get to steal the election. Ruth Ginsburg, and I love walking through the dissent in Shelby County that she writes with students, my law students. Ruth Ginsburg is like, wait a minute, hold on. I got two things. Number one, number one, do you understand that saying that you don't need that anymore because people are registered to vote is like saying because you are underneath your umbrella in a rainstorm and dry, you don't need the umbrella no more? I mean, she just, <laughs> she, just she puts the metaphor cold. <laughs> like, oh, I'm dry, so I don't need this umbrella. You stupid mother. Do you understand the only reason they are there is because of Section 4? And now you want to get rid of it because they're there. Dumb. And then she says, and number two, I ain't even going to get to that. Congress passed a renewal of the Voting Rights Act with overwhelming bipartisan majorities. Why are we substituting our judgment for the federal legislature? She's being prescient. She know why. Because these white boys know they ain't never going to win another election as long as we keep having babies. So they're going to move all this stuff to the courts. And I don't care what the law says. It is the role of the courts, this is John, this is uh, Justice Marshall in Marbury versus Madison at the beginning, to say what the law is. So we're gonna move it from, we don't care if you do pass a law, we'll just overturn it in the courts. So Ginsburg is like, first of all, well, like I said, first of all, you need it. That's why it it's, has, has been successful in part. But the second thing is, she says, it was passed with over one majority and it was passed that way because the work ain't done. And then she lists example after example of how they still discriminate. She says, in Prairie View, Texas, these boys just tried to uh, run for office. And so what they do, they threw out their voter registration. Talking about Prairie View University, she said, these kids in Prairie View look, counted up and said, oh, we got a majority. We can put somebody on city council. Uh-uh, the white boys in uh, Texas like, hell no. We're going we gonna, to we gonna disqualify y'all. They down here still in the South discriminating, trying to put people in jail. For she lists all that, but it's in dissent. Why? Because Robert's got the number. He don't care. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is gone. Her, her, the case she did uh, in 2007, Lily Ledbetter. We know the Ledbetter case. Here she is in Alabama. My mom from Alabama, so, you know, but damn Alabama. I love people in Alabama. I love Alabama. But you white nationalists in Alabama, I share nothing with you except accident of birth. And we go, we, I, I'm going to close with that. But she's at the Goodyear Tire Plant. She's been working there for years. She figures out they've been paying these dudes every two weeks. They get a check bigger than mine. And she starts adding up, and then she discovers they've been shorting me for years. So she goes to court. It gets to the Supreme Court. This is before uh, William Rehnquist croaked. William Rehnquist, whose clerk was John Roberts. White boys don't play. See, this is what, this is what, see, black people around here, oh yeah, you know, we gonna, yeah, hey, come on now, we got, we got a game to play, Let's, don't boycott, we gonna watch the football game. Meanwhile, white boys looking 50 years in the future and back mapping it, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So what is Rehnquist in the uh, good year, let, let better versus good year? Look, you can sue. And you can recover, but only from the time you discovered and only going back a few months. Ginsburg is like, she didn't have any way to figure it out. She should be able to recover from all the way back just because she just found out. And then, you know, they like, nah, she, she can recover from when she found out uh, only maybe over the past few pay periods, six months, I think was the thing. Ginsburg in dissent. And this is the thing about Supreme Court. They be arguing like cats and dogs. Sometimes they friends like Ginsburg and Scalia was, but they, they got this decorum thing, you know, where they, you know, yeah. so there's one, th there's a couple of things you really don't see a lot of. And when you see it, you be like, oh, shit. One of them is reading a dissent from the bench. Ruth Ginsburg read the dissent in the Ledbetter case from the bench. At that point, oh, shit, she's serious as hell. Her thing is, y'all ain't gonna short women out they pay. It don't matter who the uh, it's Democrats, Republicans, the same thing. Okay, tell that to your to your niece when she starts taking L's off of her pay, and it goes to federal court 
and one in 41 year old white boys who think that women should be barefoot and pregnant is the judge since it don't matter who the judge is because it's all the same see it ain't gonna affect the people who got a place to go and something it's gonna get your people ginsburg's dissent in her dissent she calls out congress congress needs to fix this oh shit. now now she done broke the real rule you ain't supposed to be talking to the other, the other branch of government yeah. you know barack obama the first law that is passed in the Obama administration is the Lily Ledbetter Act. Lily Ledbetter was still alive. Lily Ledbetter said, when I read Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's dissent, tears came to my eyes. Obama signed the legislation with the Democratic House, Democratic Senate. It was the first bill he passed. And you never forget, when his first state of the union, he came in, you know, the Supreme Court justice would be sitting there he came around the corner before he went up on the dais and Ruth Bader Ginsburg went up around his neck and hugged him. You did what I told you to do. In other words, it don't matter who the president is. Look, y'all go to hell. Do you understand? If you are a woman who ever had a, got, got knocked off because of some pay issue, that what you're saying is you don't give a damn about them? You, you don't, you gotta understand. So finally, July, this just happened, right? Two cases, they had a case uh, Little Sisters of the Poor case back in this past July. In this case, you got a situation where the Affordable Care Act, which they've been using, I didn't mention the Hobby Lobby case. We know the Hobby Lobby case. This is where them uh, white, uh, these Klansmen, because you know, the Klan is a good white Christian nationalist organization. I ain't saying they Klan, but I am saying they behaving like the Klan. Why? Because you're using the Bible as a justification for trying to take people back to medieval Europe. Women barefoot and pregnant, you ain't gonna have no contraception. So Hobby Lobby is like, we should be able to say that we don't want uh, to cover uh, uh, contraception for people. And so the Supreme Court says, yeah, Ginsburg dissents in the Hobby Lobby case. And she says, do you understand that for a woman to have to pay for her own contraception, particularly she making minimum wage, she said, do you know that in some places an IUD costs as much as a, as a month's pay for some of these women who have, uh, who have minimum wage? In other words, she said, and it was all men. <laughs> you understand? These white men, Alito, Roberts, Negro men, Thomas. We well, y'all don't know nothing about it. Ginsburg fighting like hell in dissent. So, July, little sisters of the poor say, you know, we don't, we think that we should have the religious exemption as well for contraception. The court says, yes, yeah. Skinberg's like, no, nah. hell no. Nah. And then the last case was the health resources case. And this is a case in California, you had two teachers. One lady, they want, they want, uh, they, they want, uh, I think in one case it was a substitute teacher and the other lady had uh, breast cancer. She's dead. She passed away before the court decided. Because in the first case, the school let her go. Religious, they say, because she's a minister and we think that uh, we have the right to release her. She sued for age discrimination, although it really wasn't age discrimination that was the issue. But they said, we got an exemption for ministers. She said, yeah, technically I'm a minister, but I don't preach. I just have the license. I don't, I'm not even involved. You're getting rid of me because of behavior that you say that you don't like. But you, they used the fig leaf of the religious exemption because technically she was a minister. The court said, okay. The lady with breast cancer, they said they dismissed her because of bad classroom management. That wasn't the case. You discriminated against me. I'm sick. Is it? No. The court says, well, she's technically a minister too. So we have to, what, what the hell? She dies before, I mean, cause part of the job is you got some health care. Oh, they threw her out. Ginsburg is dissenting. I'm sorry, in that case, Sotomayor wrote the dissent. In the first case, Ginsburg wrote the dissent. But this is the last thing about case law and then I'll turn to, to the larger issue. Both those cases this past July, were seven to two. Kagan and Breyer joined them five clowns, but they joined them on a technical point. See, this is the problem we have in this country right now. Some of these people think they live in a country where people have a sense of right and wrong and values and precedent. They don't understand, you're dealing with terrorists. See, I was in law school when they started the Federal Society back in the late 80s. These white boys, gonna run this thing till the wheels fall off. So Kagan and Breyer, with respect for precedent, respect for the structure of the law, they said, we don't agree with the outcome, however procedurally, 
we think that this is an issue for the lower courts to decide. So it will come back to us. So we're going to side with y'all on the technicality and then send it back to the lower court to determine whether the definition of minister is it. Yeah, yeah, you know I understand why y'all did it. And if I were a white man, because one of the reasons why I know something about all this stuff, I went to law school because I was at a black college that they were trying to use Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to term black colleges white. And I said, we can fight this intellectually. Because I'm one of them people like you think if we read and we think about this, Du Bois did the same thing. Out of Wells said, we're going to fight with words. It took me going to law school and studying like hell. I, I would go home, take a shower, eat, take a shower, take a nap, go back to Ohio State Law School with my friends, Lethia Watkins, John Stanford, all of them. And we would get back to our room at the law school at like midnight, stay there studying all night till like five, six o'clock in the morning, go home, take a shower, eat, and come back to class. I was determined, we're gonna whip. Reading page after page after page after page after page, I started to realize the law is what they say it is. And what you did last night by saying, we're gonna talk about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, sent me to somebody who has suffered because of the law. This is Mumia Abu Jamal. Have black lives ever mattered? <laughs> you understand? Know so I said, let me see what Mumia got to say about this. Cause here's a man, it don't matter who the president is. This, this man right here was on death row. You know why you don't death row no more? Lawyers and judges. All you geniuses talking about it don't matter. But anyway, Mumia says this. He says, as any, and this is something he wrote in 1998, The Law Against the Law, one of his prison commentaries. Mumia says, as any law student knows, the theory of law is vastly different from its practice. That's very true. And I want to, and then he goes on to talk about what that means. Because some people might hear that and say, well, then it don't matter who the judge is. No, this is why it matters. This is why it matters. And this is why with Ruth Bader Ginsburg gone, it's up to Sonia. Because I don't trust Kagan. I don't trust Breyer to dissent all the time. And Breyer's 82. Breyer's well, 82. And Sonia Sotomayor is in ill health as well. Quiet as Sonia well. Sotomayor is an Afro-Latina from the Bronx, Puerto Rico. You know damn well. In fact, that's why I say Clarence Thomas can come off too. My, my, the, the man that hired me at Howard, Russell Adams, the legendary uh, Africana Studies scholar. Dr. Adams, who is uh, on the 90 side of 80, he always says, look, I don't trust a black man over 50 that ain't got high blood pressure and diabetes. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> so I mean, that goes for black women too. You know what I'm saying? Wait a minute, you're a black woman over 50 and you ain't got no comorbid condition? Of course, Sonia Sotomayor. Of course, Claire Stein. Yes, mortality is real. And then, as we know, Ruben Ginsburg fell and broke her ribs. That's when they found them two polyps. And her, because she had broke three ribs. I'm saying, so you never know. And then you turn around and Scalia drops dead and one of them hunting lodges and white supremacists got it out all over the country for target practice. So you never know who it is. Yeah. So, but, 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 but it's going to be left up to Sotomayor for the foreseeable future to write the dissent because these numbers ain't going to change. So anyway, Mumia, well, this is what I want to kind of, Mumia says that the law as its practice is different than theory. And I know that well. Absolutely. I think everybody does when you're facing a judge. The law is what they say. Just like people say, well, police can't do that. The police, they stopped you. You know what the law is? Whatever he says it is, which is why we always tell young people, your number one job is to survive this encounter. So don't be out there arguing. I know you want to. I know you didn't watch videos and you didn't seen all the stuff and you think you can. Look, it's midnight and ain't nobody out here and ain't no cell phones. Your job is to survive. We'll fight the rest of it tomorrow. Please understand. So, but what, what that means is the courts, the courts, the judges can either enhance the ability of these people to go rogue or create through interpreting the law a, a, a kind of environment where they think twice. It doesn't mean that they're gonna stop something that happens to you at the moment. But if a, imagine everybody what Gil Scott Heron say many years ago, every channel that I stop on got a different kind of cop on, a baby can tell you you have the right to remain silent. Do you understand? Because, but that right is not in the Constitution. That right was interpreted in Miranda. In other words, so before a cop makes a choice on doing certain things, she or he got to think about the thing they were trained to. They may still do it. But if what happens when the judge says, no, you don't have a right to remain silent. Wait, what? Oh shit, the leash is off? Watch this. 
we're going to ride up in here. People have to understand the judge is not going to save you unless, of course, you're talking about mandatory minimums being overturned and all kind of other stuff. But the judge interpretation can create an environment that makes it more difficult for the thing that's about to go down on you to happen. And it may not mean anything to all our folks who got plenty of room to spare. It's going to mean to somebody who's making minimum wage. It's going to mean for somebody who is dealing with these other issues, these living and dying issues. So let, let, let me say this, because I know, I don't even, let me see what time is. I got to yeah, see what yeah, time. I got to look at my... Yeah, you got 10 minutes. Oh, no, it's okay. We got, yeah, we got, I, 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 I won't be you. much longer. I got you. I got you. Okay, I know you do. I, I know you do. I know you do. I know you do. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Citizenship. We talk about citizenship a lot in this country. And this is what makes me sad, really sad. When I think about the brilliant people, and I know this is for a future in class, and we had this conversation about curriculum and where should we start history and all this kind of thing. Why should, some, why should somebody have more or less rights because they're a citizen? Citizenship is the foundation for legal humanity in the United States. It has been used as a carrot and it has been used as a stick. In Brown, they're trying to give Negroes a carrot to keep them from looking at their cousins all over the world. The carrot is, we're gonna change these laws. But the laws they changed greatly benefited, it's what Carol Anderson and them write about, more benefited the white elite. It didn't necessarily benefit everybody the same way. And so when we start talking about citizenship, that's the first issue we have. And by the way, as I said, they're gonna attack birthright citizenship. Martha Jones, who people are talking about now for voting rights, who's standing on the shoulders of women like Sharon Harley, uh, who really wrote probably the definitive work on black women in the vote. The late Sharon Harley, uh, Morgan State University, a lot of these HBCU scholars, particularly these women. Now people are saying, oh, I'm the first and this is the best. It ain't the best, you not the first. So, you know, Betty Collier Thomas, my old professor from Temple University. These are, these sisters right here, these are the G's from back in the day, Sharon Harley at the University of Maryland. All these, these are the black women who did all that work on black women and voting in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, going back to Helen Edmonds and all that. But at any rate, they're gonna attack birthright citizenship. Martha Jones did a great book on birthright citizenship. I, I thought about it because she just did this book on black women and the vote. So I thought about the women who wrote before her, but her book on birthright citizenship is laying out what it is, how it operates, and now Stephen Miller, he, they're obsessed with birthright citizenship because they're trying to get it. Ruth Ginsburg, her father and mother came from Russia. You understand? But nobody, going back to where we began, nobody ever challenged her white her citizenship because whiteness. But if your mother and father came from one of these countries that Donald Trump has referred as asshole countries, but you were born here, Miller and them looking, and Jeff Sessions, you know, Miller worked for Jeff Sessions. They looking like, how can we knock this out? We got to get past this right here. We got to get this birthright citizenship. Because again, it's judge-made interpretations that will, that will shade this. And understand, if they get birthright citizenship, the United States will join many other countries where it doesn't matter if you were born here. If your parents were born somewhere else, then we'll go to court and fight about it. So at any rate, citizenship is legal humanity. So once that's been established, I say, well, I'm here, I'm, I'm an American, I was born here. Okay, what does that come with? What does citizenship come with? And then you gotta ask yourself a question. You have a right to a trial? I do. Do you have a right for the jury to reflect the color and the culture of the people in your neighborhood? Uh, yeah, no you don't. As early as the 1880s, the Supreme Court says that you have the right to be judged by a jury of your peers, and that means people who constitute the people who live around wherever you're being tried. But jury selection for years, if a black person did figure out how to get in the jury pool, by the way, it don't matter who, I ain't voting, register to vote pool, where do you think they get the jury selection pool from? Now your cousin on trial and, it, and, it's, and it's 50 people they picking from and it's four black people because you didn't register to vote and your name not even in a row. And when you did register and they did, you ignored the son. Please do jury duty. Do you understand? That's the people sitting in the box who are saying, I don't know nothing about these black people right here. Send our ass to jail. I mean, this is, this is where, this, don't make it easy. You should at least fight a little bit. God. So anyway, jury selection, the Batson versus Kentucky case, this is a case that comes before the Supreme Court where they're asking, um, 
when 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 prosecutors come up, there's two types of ways you get that, that they can get you off a jury. One's called a peremptory strike. The other is the, during the voir dire process, and then they got challenged for calls. So they can look at a jury box and say, uh, I want numbers 8, 28, 34, 72 off. Just said, okay. 8, 28, 32, 74. They all black. Oh, wait, you used your peremptory strikes to get rid of these black people. Yeah. Batson versus Kentucky case. So you can't do it. Uh, uh, hold on. Now the defense, I got a Batson challenge. Why? Even though you don't have to give a reason, is it just coincidence that you got rid of all the black people in the jury pool? And so at that point, the Batson challenge is supposed to trigger a process by which you got to discern whether there's some other intent. It's, a, it's, it's kind of toothless because, you know, you, you can kind of make any kind of excuse. But then the challenge for cause, you say, you know what? I ain't going to use my peremptories. I got you. Because there was a, in fact, I don't know, you probably remember this Pennsylvania uh, DA or prosecutor that was, this show, had a tape on how to get rid of people oh, yeah. in the jury pool. You remember? You know? So they bring you in and say, uh, Miss Hunter? Yes. Uh, are you a Christian? Yes. Do you believe that murder is wrong? Yes. Okay. What church do you go to? Well, I go to Bethel AME Church. You know, and I'd like number 53 stricken front. Wait. What what did I do? Well, it's been shown that, you know, uh people who have strong Christian views that go to black churches, well, sometimes they can't really vote for the death penalty. And so well, it's the devil. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah. He's back. Yeah. The uh Sometimes it's been shown that they really can't, you know, they can't be trusted. They, they, they may not vote for the death penalty. Oh, okay. In other words, even if you have challenge for cause, you can come up with a different set of questions and get rid of the black people if you got a playbook where they training you on the questions to trigger black people. And so jury selection is not, it may not be as important to you or me, but it's important to other people. Domestic disputes. I mean, what, what, are we, what are we talking about? It's the framework. Judges have the power of life and death. So we got, it's, it's really, this is where I'll close. We got three levels to this in terms of judge-made law. One is living, custody cases, like adoptive couple versus baby girl. The John Roberts want to know what percentage of blood makes you an Indian? What, 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 what the hell are you talking It's a custody battle. Yeah, but the guy said he's Native American and his daughter's Native American and him and, the, him and the girl weren't together and she gave the baby up to adopt this white couple. He said she didn't tell him that's what she was going to do. So now he want to exercise his rights. And so, yeah, nah, but what percentage of blood makes you a Native? John Roberts, you racist son of a bitch. You so, so, so here go, you know, sort of your and them. What the hell are you doing, man? But the point is, if you're in a custody battle, it matters very much who the judge is. Do you understand? If you are dealing with child support, it very, it very much, you know, it, it really matters who the judge is, the living and dying. Somebody accused you of making terroristic threats because you got a little loud in the mall because some white boy said, excuse me, did you pay for that? Oh, God. Next thing you know, you in handcuffs before a judge. It matters very much who the judge is. The pe so the living part is very important. Then the second part is changing the law. How are you gonna change the law to protect the people who do most of the living and dying in this country? We gotta protect their right to vote. Okay, well, we got a statute. Yeah, but you know, people aren't discriminating like you, then you. Ruben Ginsburg is, fool, it's not raining because you got an umbrella. Now, now you're telling me you don't need the umbrella because you dry? What the hell are you talking about? You know, the second level is fighting to change the law and the judges have a lot to do with determining that. Donald Trump out here talking about, you know, a lot of people don't know. A lot of people don't know it's really about the 12th Amendment. Oh, shit. They done started talking about the 12th Amendment. Do you understand that if they can test the results of the election in November, if they can test long enough and several states refuse to certify the election, let's say Florida, Bush versus Gore, refuses to certify. Let's say a couple other Republican-controlled states, legislatures, refuse to certify. Do you know then that it can go to the United States Congress? to pick the president under the 12th Amendment, and it's not going to a Congress of 535 or 435 on the House side, every state gets one vote. That's how they gonna steal the election. Do you understand Bush versus Gore was just them clearing their throat? And now Ruth Bader Ginsburg is gone. So even if you had one of them white supremacists, including that Negro white nationalist, who might have a change of heart because he realized that if you steal the election this way, the next step is cats is gonna be in the street fighting 
or it don't matter who the judge is, you strap. Because now they're going to test the Second Amendment. And here's how they're going to test the Second Amendment. Second Amendment sound real good until a judge decides that you are indeed a threat to national security, that they do indeed have the ability to send in weaponized uh, state terrorist squads from the federal government in combination with these police union thugs to basically kill anybody in the street of Chicago. And it has been sanctioned by a federal judge because they've decided that the administrative decision made by the attorney general has designated you as a chair. Damn the FBI. Christopher Ray was on Capitol Hill last week saying, Antifa is an ideology. There ain't no organization. Oh, no. It's going to be what the judge says it is once they make this decision. See, y'all, it don't matter who the judge is. You, okay. It may not matter to you because you living in a high rise on Michigan Avenue in Chicago with your cousins and them on the south side. <laughs> them Negroes got to get caught up in something and you're not going to be there to save them. And I love how people who say it doesn't matter when they get caught up. The first thing they want to talk about is their rights. You can't do that to me. Yeah, my rights. Hold on. <laughs> you ain't got no rights. Why you want to talk about your rights at this point? And in terms of political prisoners, how many more political prisoners are we going to have to join Mumia and Russell Maroon Schultz and them if they decide to categorize the conversation we have? Because the First Amendment is how John Roberts has been attacking. He's been protecting religious organizations. He's been protecting, but they can use it the other way as well to say this is not protected speech. Black Lives Matter is a terrorist organization. That's the one they coming for, sis. Yeah. I know. Karen, that's so, the one they coming for. We got we got five minutes. Um, and let me, again, thank you. Uh, my, my soul is not at ease. I don't really have an answer. Is there <laughs> any, uh, besides voting in November and showing up in yes. person and making sure, you know, like it, that's that's the, the, the easy solution. Yes. Even that's not foolproof. What, no. what what comfort do you get? Because I, you know, I pride myself in in being, uh, you know, somewhat again optimistic, and and I want to provide some source of comfort for folk who are like distressed, yes. and they should be. Well, I would say this in closing, and maybe a couple more. First thing is we have to study so that we can act responsibly. Don't don't get caught up in basically what is basically advertise ad wars. You can't reduce deep study to a sound bite. So that's one reason why we having these conversations. Uh, this, is, this is my man, the, the, the late Ron Walters. This is his book, White Nationalism, Black Interests. If you want to understand what's going on in the country, go to one of the greatest political scientists of his time, White Nationalism, Black Interests. This is Ron Walters, the late Ron Walters. It's been 10 years since he made transition. He was one of the people who helped craft Jesse Jackson's 1984 and 88 runs, conservative public policy and the black community. This book uh, was published in 2003. So not, not, not long before he made transition. So the first thing is to understand how public policy works and how white nationalism advances its interests. What does that translate to in terms of action? Once you understand that, we understand that we must work locally and we must work with states. States are the great strength of the white settler colonial project. You understand? Because by adding states, what they were able to do was give themselves a safety valve to demographics. We crowded up in New York and Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. You got Idaho, North, South Dakota. You know, they, it, so, so with the Electoral College, you can always manage this until we all move out to places like that. So what do you do? At the state level and local level, get involved, organize, get petitions to get referenda on the ballots constitutional amendments. Know who everybody is on your ballot. And overturning the Electoral College isn't as hard as people might think it is, but you got to educate yourself on how these structures work. And so I can't do anything. Do you live somewhere? Yes, then you can do something. Because we got to say city councils. We got So in this election coming up now, and early voting's already started in places like Virginia, make sure you register, check your registration, go out there. And it's not just about Trump and Biden or Pence and Harris. This is about who your city council person is, who your mayor is, who your municipality is. So that seems like a small thing, but if you do that, you've got to at least put this up for a fight because state constitutions have a lot to do with this. State constitutions, Pennsylvania, for example, just said, you know what, no, you got to restore this and we're going to let people turn their ballots in after uh, November the 3rd. Guess what? Alito, who was on the federal court, third circuit up there in Philly, uh, Alito got mad last time the Pennsylvania uh, State uh, Supreme Court said something. He said, well, send it down here to look at. Then people say, okay, 
Go ahead and look at it, because you know this is the state Supreme Court, and there's no federal issue. So stay your Klansman ass out of it. So this is the state to bring. I mean, California Constitution is very different than the Alabama. State. I mean, so wherever you live, know what's in your Constitution, and at least I know my rights. I had a right to remain. No, no, no. Get the state constitution. Look at the city charter. And then from there, you organize. That's where some of these young people, I love these young people, Jackson, Mississippi, Raleigh, North Carolina, they are learning the laws at the local level and then beginning to run for office. All these black women, so I know we got, that, that, that's, that's one thing. Um, on the international side, make some friends. <laughs> In other words, and but what does that mean? What does that translate into? Another book I'll mention by Ron Walters. I love this brother. He, Ron Walters, was just before he made transition, the last class he spoke to at Howard, he was sick by that point, uh, was my class. Every semester I would have them read this book, Pan-Africanism in the African Diaspora. This was a brother out of Wichita, Kansas. He and the woman who eventually he becomes married to, Pat Walters, still alive, good sister, they helped lead some of the sit-in protests that predate the National Student Movement in the 60s. He wanted to be a lawyer. Then he goes to Fisk University, runs into these scholars, I'm gonna be a historian. He ends up a political scientist. But he was one of the most brilliant and the most hardworking and just beautiful brothers ever to know. He traveled the world. And so what he's saying is, while we're dealing domestically with white nationalism, understand you're part of a black world. So those of you with a little job somewhere and you save a little money, make some friends, and maybe buy you a little piece of land in Ghana or Jamaica. Get your established, maybe even residency if you can, or a business relationship, because you might need somewhere to go to and come back from. Just because you go somewhere don't mean you can't come back. This country is going to collapse. And I don't mean that with a sense of dread. I mean that it was founded on a lie. It was founded on evil. And you can't prop it up with 1619 or 1776 or 1620 or 1786. It can't be propped up. So you can try to convince these people that yes, we here and I love you, we built this country. Why do you want credit for a criminal enterprise? I understand, because you was educated to think that somehow your whole identity is tied up in this notion of citizenship, legal humanity. So make some friends, make some connections, begin to establish, and then maybe even pursue dual citizenship. There are a lot of countries with dual citizenship. And I tell my Howard students all the time, if I see a child with a name like Omoruade or um, um, on Yama, I'm like, you Nigerian? Yeah. You got two passports, right? Oh, no. Get your other passport. Because, <laughs> see, Nigeria, you could be born in the United States, but if your mom and them from there, you can get a passport. I have the most fun when we're all in class, because, you know, Howard, like every other HBCU, people think, oh, they're all black. No, these niggas from all over. Watch this. I got a class of 100 students. I'm like, how many of y'all from the Caribbean? Hands up. Keep your hand up if you got more than one passport. You see the hand still up. The American Negroes is like, what? Oh, yeah, Jamaica. I got a Jamaica passport. They, they don't even say nothing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Look into dual citizenship. Because, see, what that also establishes is you got some people who can help you. So you ain't got to just go to the American court. You can go to the consulate. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You can go to the and network and organize support. If you can't get another passport, if you ain't got no money to buy no land somewhere, get on the internet while it's still going because I'm going to tell you right now, First Amendment. I'm telling these judges, do you yeah. understand the FCC can shut all this shit. Oh, all right. You know what I'm saying? You so, have, so, so go, you know, the last network. Network. You know what I'm network. Okay. Network with your people, particularly young people. They're already Facebook friends. Begin to understand the world you live in because Ruth Bader Ginsburg is an ancestor. This country, these white nationalists have decided they're going to ride it till the wheels fall off. But here's the beautiful thing about countries. They come and go. They come and go. And guess what? As Stoney Carmichael said, we have to prepare so that our people will survive America. It ain't going to be here in much longer in the form that it's in. We'll survive because this is, I keep saying last, this is the last thing I'll say because it really just, like you, I was like, damn, like everybody, really. Uh, my man, Marari Garima, Holly and Shrigiana Garima's son, his, his, his film debuted on Netflix last night. Uh, Shrikiana and Haile son Marawi's done this whole thing on gentrification. It's called Residue. Ava DuVernay, looking for the next generation of filmmakers, said, I'm, I got you. I got you, young boy. I'm going to put you on, my, I'm going to pick you up on my thing. And they had, a, they supposed to have a watch party last night. The news dropped. They canceled the watch party. I'm saying, don't cancel the watch party. Let's keep going. No, okay, okay, all right, fine. Because part of me is, yes, because I was born in Nashville. I went to law school. 
I remember when Clarence Thomas was appointed and we was all like, damn. And I remember Ginsburg. I read those cases. I teach those cases. So I understand the power and language of the law. For a moment, I was caught up in that. The last poet said, there's a brother out there getting sucked in by all that shit on the wall. I was one of them Negroes. I'm reading Cardozo like, oh my God, that Paul's great case is brilliant. I'm like, yes, it's there, but, but I caught myself because I'm black in the world. This country is too small for us. It always was. You can't contain us. We overflow your boundaries. Do you understand? The, but the only way we get really depressed is when we narrow our focus to this little red, white, and blue flag and try to come up with another number scheme that's going to make them love us. They not going to love you. <laughs> that Embrace the world. That's all I'm going to end with that. <laughs> we overflow this boundary. We, we overflow. We always have. I love you. I love you. I love you too. Great car. <laughs> Go do your thing. We're going to talk yes, I gotta roll. next week. All right.